in the quantum physics world, there's a thing called entanglement. Entanglement means that you have these pairs of opposites. It doesn't matter how far away they are, they still function as a one unit, a simultaneous pair of opposites. Well, the brain and the mind tend to have this sort of entangled relation. Since I was 18 years old, I've had a interest in discovering the hidden order in life's apparent chaos and been studying every aspect of psychology and physics and you name it to assist in this pursuit. And so I'd like to share with you something that I know will be very thought provoking at least and definitely meaningful if you apply it. So if you're, let, let's say you meet somebody that you're very infatuated with and you are conscious of their upsides and momentarily unconscious of their downsides and are impulsively attracted to them and have them so, you're so enamored that they occupy space and time in your mind and kind of run you. To the degree that you're infatuated with them and philic or attracted to them, you're gonna be phobic on the idea of somebody taking them away. In other words, you might be jealous, you might uh, fear their loss, in other words. Anything you're infatuated with, you fear their loss. So at the exact moment that you have a philia, which is an attraction, an impulse towards, you also have the fear of the loss of that which you seek. One of the greatest uh, primary fears in life and distresses in life is the perception of loss of that which you seek. So if you're mildly attracted, you'll have a mild fear of it being gone. If you're highly attracted, you'll have a bigger fear. So the greater the infatuation, the greater the phobia. And phobias are a byproduct of that. On the other side of the equation, you've also probably run into people that you just don't necessarily get along with so well. You might even resent them or despise them. And now you're conscious of the downside and unconscious of the upside. And you have an instinct to avoid them. But what's interesting is to the degree that you are resenting them or wanting to avoid them, you also create a dissociated fantasy about what it's going to be like to get away from them, to escape them. It'll be a relief. It'd be a grief if they came near you. There'd be a relief if you got away from them. If the people you're infatuated with came near you, you have relief. If it gets away from you, you have grief. Now, all of a sudden, you have a reciprocal fantasy to escape that which you are resenting. So the phobia of being around the person that you resent is associated with the philia, the fantasy of escaping them. In other words, the moment you are philic with something, you're phobic. And the moment you're phobic with something, you're philic. They're simultaneous in the brain. If you infatuate with somebody who's intelligent, you'll resent somebody who's ignorant. If you resent somebody who's ignorant, you'll infatuate with somebody who's intelligent. The brain has a reciprocal contrast. Wilhelm Wandt, an early psychologist over 125 years ago, said there are simul simultaneous contrasts in the mind. But most people are subjectively biased in their interpretation of their reality, and they are sequentially seeing them. That means they're momentarily subjectively biased towards something and infatuated with it and see all the upsides, but don't see the downsides and don't see a simultaneous aspect of the philia and the phobia. And other times they're they're resentful to something and they're conscious of the downsides, unconscious of the upsides and don't see the upsides and then label it something to avoid. And our impulses and instincts are survival strategies to, a, to a seek prey and to avoid predator. And anything that supports our value represents prey and anything that challenges our value represents predator. But actually at any one moment, they're both simultaneously going on. It's been shown in ecobiology that maximum growth and development of a human being occurs at the border of the support and the challenge, the philia, the phobia, the prey and the predator. Imagine if you're out in the world, in the world of ecology, and you're, uh, you have food that represents prey and something that wants to eat you representing predator, 
if you didn't have a predator, you, all you had is prey and all you did is had something to eat and you didn't have any concern about a predator, you might overeat. Your ghrelin uh, hormone in the brain will be accentuated and you'll probably overeat. And if you do, you'll be gluttonous, you'll gain weight, you'll get heavy and you will be sluggish and you won't be fit. So the predator standing by, make sure you eat just the right amount of food to maintain fitness because you eat too much, you'll be tired and you won't be able to run fast and you'll get eaten by the predator. So the predator's presence keeps the, the ghrelin and leptin hormones in eating in balance. And you need both that support and challenge. And if you had nothing but a challenge, a predator standing by and you didn't have any food or any prey to eat, you'd end up emaciated and starved and then not have the energy for fitness. So nature has an ecosystem that has prey and predator, support and challenge, philia and phobia, because you're philic towards food and you're phobic towards predator eating you. One is pleasure, one is pain. So maximum growth and development occurs at the border of pleasure and pain, support and challenge, prey and predator, uh, positive and negative, you know, all pairs of opposites. Heraclitus, the earliest philosopher back in the fifth century BC, talked about these pairs of opposites. Naxagoras, another philosopher even before him, talked about the pairs of opposites of pleasure and pain and how they're inseparable. Kipling said that we try to separate the inseparables, divide the indivisibles, label the unlabelables, name the inevitables, polarize the unpolarizables, and try to see them sequentially instead of see them simultaneously. Well, many years ago, I was trying to find a hidden order in the apparent chaos, and I found out that chaos, or what is called disorder, or is another name for entropy, the tendency to go from order to disorder, is, according to Claude Shannon, missing information. So missing information is the unconscious mind. So in other words, when we're infatuated, we're unconscious and missing information about the downside. We're resentful, we're unconscious and missing information about the upside. As a result of that, we're ignorant of what the whole is. We're not mindful, we're mindless. We're ignorant of that. And the missing information is called entropy, which is called disorder. But when all of a sudden you see both of them simultaneously and you're fully aware or mindful of both sides simultaneous, both the prey and the predator, the, the pain, the pleasure, etc., you're not fooled by the ignorance and you're able to be present and um, maximize your potential. Maximum potential occurs at the border of these two things. Maximum growth and development occurs or maximum fitness occurs there. So wisdom is knowing how to wake up in our mind the questions that make us aware of the part we normally ignore. Now, we have a very interesting thing. We have a lower subcortical amygdala portion of our telencephalon, and that part of our brain is involved in seeking and avoiding. It's the survival center, or in a sense, desire center, desire to seek that which you feed off of and desire to avoid that which is feeding off you. We also have an executive center, which is the immediate, immediate prefrontal cortex and prefrontal cortex area. And that is able to see both of them objectively simultaneously. So if we're under survival mode, we tend to have a, a, a false a perception. We tend to have missing information. We tend to have a seeking or avoiding. We tend to have impulse and instinct. And we're basically in a survival mode. This is not where we maximize our fitness. This is a distress zone. Because anytime we fear the loss of something or fear the gain of something, we have distress and we're living in a phobic environment. But the moment we see both sides simultaneously and we're present and we see the hidden order because we see both sides simultaneously and nothing is missing in our awareness, we're not ignorant, we're with wisdom. Wisdom is the instantaneous recognition that the blessing and the crisis come together, the support and challenge. So if I came to you and I said, you're always nice and never mean, always kind, never cruel, there's a part of you that would intuitively know eh, that's not true. If I said, you're always mean, never nice, always cruel, never kind, eh, you'd go, no, that's not true. But if I said, sometimes you're nice when you're being supported, sometimes you're mean when you're being challenged, you would go, yep, that's true. You have both sides and they're actually simultaneous. You can be nice to somebody, mean to somebody else, give attention to somebody and ignore somebody else. Now, if you're fully aware of this in others and in yourself and in life in general, you're able to stay centered and maximize your potential. I call that the great discovery. 
I discovered that in the mind, there's not one, one side, there's not a one sided environment. What I found out is let's say somebody comes up to you and they challenge you, and then you, they do a behavior, some trait, action, or inaction that you dislike or despise that you're perceiving them demonstrating. So I ask the question, what specific trait, action, or inaction do I, do you perceive this individual displaying or demonstrating that you despise or dislike or hate most? Boom. And you write down verbal criticism, let's say. And then you stop right there at that moment. You go, okay, verbal criticism. That means you're not seeing praise. You're seeing criticism. You're seeing rejection, maybe. You're seeing a put down, but you're not seeing the uplift. And what's interesting in, in the quantum physics world, there's a thing called entanglement. Entanglement means that you have these pairs of opposites. It doesn't matter how far away they are. They still function as a one unit, a simultaneous pair of opposites. Well, the brain and the mind tend to have this sort of entangled relation. Uh, the moment you're seeing something that's critical, you're comparing it to its opposite that you're perceiving in your mind that somebody praising you. And in your mind, your mind brings up what is called an anti-memory at the same moment that you're perceiving they're criticizing you. And you're comparing it to somebody that's praising you. And the pleasure of one accentuates the pain of the other. So as long as you're addicted to the pleasure of somebody supporting you, you're going to fear and not like the pain associated with the person who's criticizing you. As long as you're addicted to praise, reprimand is going to hurt. As long as you're addicted to support, challenge is going to be pain. So as long as you're looking for one side, the other side's there. And it's there entangled as a pair of opposites. They're simultaneous. But we don't see it. We're ignoring it. And when we're in survival mode, we see only one side. And we, we have a skewed view, a subjective bias view, a false positive or a false negative. A false positive is assuming something that's there that's not. And a false negative is not assuming something's not there that is. And so we end up having these confirmation, disconfirmation biases on our reality and not see things as they are. We see things as we assume they are. And this is our reality that causes us impulses and instincts and let the world around us run us. Because anything we infatuate with occupies space and time in our mind and anything we resent occupies space and time in our mind. So we're now a victim of our environment or our misperceptions. And so we disempower our life. We don't empower our life with that. But the moment we ask a quality question, go to a moment where and when you perceive this individual displaying or demonstrating the specific trait, action, inaction you despise most, verbal criticism. Great. Go to that moment. You there? Great. Where are you? When are you? And this is activating an episodic memory in the brain to make sure you're really present. What exactly are they doing that you're judging? What's the context? Why are they doing it? Because it's not a, just a random event or something you're doing that's challenging their values enough for them to want to do it or it's something that you're being cocky down to them and you're needing criticism to be brought into homeostasis and authenticity. There's a reason for it. What's the context? And then who are they doing it to? You in this case. And if you go and get present with those five variables, where, when, content, context, and also who their vector is, who they're doing it to, and you get present in that moment with that, that state, your intuition will pop up the other side. Just like if I told you you're always happy and always and never sad, your intuition would go and think of times when you're sad and automatically pull it up. And the moment you actually get present with those five variables and look at who they did it to, and then at that moment, look at who are you comparing it to, you'll find out that your mind will surface instantaneously an individual in reality or in virtual reality that is counterbalancing that at the moment. And if you become aware of both of them at the same time, you see the hidden order in the apparent chaos. The chaos or disorder is the missing information. But if you're fully aware of both of them, you see the hidden order. Now, when I was 18 years old, I, I remember reading a Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz's Discourse on Metaphysics and some of his textbooks, The Odyssey and the Monadology. And when I was reading it, he was, he was taking a group of students and he asked them to write down some random dots on a piece of paper and to remember the sequence in which they wrote them and to outline the sequence as one, 20 different uh, numbers and then they would turn it in and he'd put a Cartesian um, grid on it. And then he would basically ask them um, or he'd go through there and figure out the mathematical formula, the function of X versus Y in order to show them that inside their apparent chaos, there was a hidden order. And then I, I realized that uh, Ludman's Voltzman basically back when I was 18 said that, that there was a, that probability of chaos in the universe is simply, we just don't know all the different variables there. 
If we did, we would realize that there's still a hidden order in it. So I always say that, uh, as Claude Shannon says, that, that, that chaos is missing information. It's unconscious information. If we ask the right questions and become conscious of what it is, we can see the hidden order in our apparent chaos. We can then become poised instead of poisoned. We can see simultaneous contrast at that moment because we're fully aware, we're mindful, we're present, and we liberate ourselves from the distractions that occupy space and time in our mind and become really empowered and present and maximally fit. So the quality of our life is based on the quality of the questions we ask. If we ask questions that make us aware of the unconscious, simultaneous with the conscious, we become fully conscious. <clears throat> so I teach a program called the Breakthrough Experience. The Breakthrough Experience I've done 1,140 times. It's something that I share around the world. And uh, what I do in that program is I introduce a methodology, a specific set of questions, which makes up a method that allows you to see this hidden order and take the baggage that's stored in the subconscious mind from all those things that we are uh, running away from and seeking. Because anytime we see only one side and we're ignorant of the other side and we're infatuated or resentful, or we, uh, you know, we're unconscious of information, it's stored in the subconscious mind as an impulse and instinct that makes us uh, like an automaton react to our environment without us even having governance. But if all of a sudden we ask both sides and see both sides, we liberate ourselves and we act from within and we're independent. And so in the, the breakthrough experience, I teach a method called the Demartini method. And a subset of that is a particular set of questions called the great discovery. And the great discovery is a set of questions that make you fully conscious of these pairs of opposites at the same time. As Wilhelm once said that you now have simultaneous contrast. Or as Heraclitus says, you're able to see the pairs of opposites at the same time. This is like the same thing that Zeno did, the philosopher who tried to use the dialectic in philosophy to have a proposition and the anti-proposition and to eventually merge them in a synthesis as Hegel would do and liberate ourselves from the baggage of these opinions, these subjected bias opinions. And the dialectic was used in philosophy to gain wisdom. And so by doing this method that I teach in the Breakthrough Experience, you really gain appreciation and wisdom. Because when you see the hidden order in things, you become grateful, your heart opens, you're actually inspired, you're now inwardly driven, you return into your executive function in the brain where you're objective, you set real goals in real time, not skewed goals. Because when you're manic uh, and elated looking down on somebody and puffing yourself up with pride, you tend to set too big a goal in too short a time frame. When you're minimizing yourself looking up to somebody that you're infatuated, you tend to set too small a goal in too long a time frame. Both of those are feedback mechanisms to guide you back into authenticity. But if you actually balance those, you become authentic. And everybody wants to be loved and appreciated for who they are. When they are who they are, they get to feel that. If they're not who they are, when they're puffing themselves with pride or minimizing themselves with shame because they're looking down or up at people, then what happens is they don't get to be authentic. You don't have fulfillment in life. So doing the method, the Demartini method, that particularly the column six and 13 or the great discovery component, which allows you to see simultaneous contrast, which allows you to put the puzzle of the disorder back into order, allows you to stand very strong in, in inside not letting the external world run you and letting you run you. And you basically then set your life and live by design, not default. Because most of the time we're running our lives trying to avoid and seek instead of actually pursue by design what is meaningful and inspiring to us. Extracting meaning out of our existential existence on this planet is the intuition trying to make you aware of what's been unconscious and bring you back into the mean between the pairs of opposites. Aristotle wrote about this in his times. And he was showed that the golden mean was the balance between the excess and deficiency of perceptions. So for excessively seeing the upsides and deficiently seeing the draw downsides, the middle between those is the authentic state. And this is where the mean is. And then we extract meaning out of it. So if you're infatuated, you extract meaning by finding the downsides. When you're resentful to something, you extract meaning by finding the upsides. If you see them simultaneously, you live with meaning. And the distinction between us and the animals is the animal can be avoiding and seeking and live with a prey and predator mentality and a subjective bias and in survival, but it's the human being that can extract meaning out of its existence, transcend those pairs of opposites and put them into simultaneous contrast and allow life to end up being present. Timeless mind, ageless body states. 
because we found the hidden order. In the book, What is Life by Erwin Schrodinger, Nobel Prize winner, he talked about uh, neg entropy, the opposite of entropy. Since entropy is missing information, neg entropy is refining that information. That's why in the breakthrough experience and the Demartini method, which is a gold mine of information, knowing how to ask the right question and becoming aware of the information that you perceived was missing and now become cognizant of it, liberates you from a lot of subconsciously stored baggage and allows you to sail free, liberated, doing what's inspiring to you intrinsically. We have a set of values in our life and whatever's highest on our value, um, which I call the telos, is the one that we are spontaneously inspired to act. And it's in that action and the, pers the pursuit of that that gives us the most objective uh, activities. And what objective activity means ones that we embrace both sides simultaneous. So when we're living and filling our day with the highest priority action possible, we have the most objectivity, the most neutrality, the most awareness and fullness, mindfulness. That's why if you fill your day with high priority actions, inspire you, it doesn't fill up with low priority distractions that don't. Distractions are those things that impulse and instinct you because of subjective biases. All of your distractions in life, which you call problems, are nothing more than incomplete awarenesses. I've taken people and been consulting with people for decades, and I assure you, every problem you'll ever face in any of the seven areas of your life comes down to missing information. That's what a problem is. It's missing information that's keeping you from being objective and neutral and present and you're basically, you're not having resilience. When you're neutral, you don't fear the loss of things. You don't fear the gain of things. You're able to adapt. When you're not neutral and you're highly polarized, you're automatically fearing the loss or fearing the gain. So if you want to live beyond the fear zone and try to and have a transcendent awareness and see simultaneous opposites and realize that there is pairs of opposites at all time, 24 hours a day, our life is like a stream of consciousness, as William James said. And the stream of consciousness, moment by moment, millisecond by millisecond, picosecond by picosecond, perceptions. And every perception has a pair of opposites. And if you can actually go and be very present in that moment and follow this Demartini method moment by moment, the moment you see both sides, you dissolve the subconsciously stored baggage that is like an animal inside you and wake up a, a higher ordered state, which is like an angel in you, and liberate yourself from the subconscious baggage that's running your life and end up living your life by an inspired mission. There's a passion down below, which is avoiding and seeking, and there's a mission from within, which is an intrinsic calling towards something that's a contribution that's sustainable and a fair exchange with you and the world around you. And you can't have fair exchange as long as you're looking up or looking down at people or minimizing or exaggerating yourself Anytime you have a state of equanimity and a poised state, which the Demartini method helps you develop, then you are able to have a greater equanimity within and an equity without, which allows you to have sustainable relationship dynamics. So you get the benefit of less noise in the brain. You get a business development because you're not uh, negating your customers, negating your staff. Uh, you're allowing yourself to have equality and you end up having the same thing in, in finances because emotions are what undermine financial growth. You're able to do it, as Buffett says, until you can manage emotions, don't expect to manage money. And in relationships itself, uh, if you are too cocky or too humble, you're going to be neutralized by your, your partner. In social settings, again, the, every area of life, your physical health and well-being, you're not going to expect to have physiological well-being unless you have poised and equilibrium of opposites. Resilience and adaptability and physiology occur when you have a balanced mind. You can't have a balanced physiology without a balanced mind. And also... In spirituality, very essence of equanimity is our spiritual path. It's a state of grace. It's a state of gratitude. The executive center in the forebrain is, is called the gratitude center. And when you have things in neutral balance and objective, you end up waking up your appreciation and love for life. So my message today <laughs> is on the significance of seeing the great discovery, the hidden order in the apparent chaos by learning to ask questions that allow you to be conscious of the unconscious information that allows you to be fully aware. And um, that's why the Demartini method in the breakthrough experience is so crucial for a mastered life. And why I wanna share that with as many people as I can. I've worked on that literally since I was 18 on how that developed and how to ask those questions and do it. And I take you methodically through that process in order to master your life with it. Because every time you transcend the subconscious storage and put it into a super conscious storage, 
you end up living your life by an inspiration, not a quiet life of desperation. A quiet life of desperation is when your impulses and instincts are running you like the animal instead of your angelic missionary uh, message of the world. You want to get your message out in the world, you need that angelic part of you, the, 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 the more enlightened part of you. The more enlightened part of you is the one that's fully conscious. So I just wanted to go off on a few moments on that and to elaborate on these pairs of opposites, the simultaneous contrast. You can look at Wilhelm Wundt, M-U-N-D-T, in his work on simultaneous contrast and his laws of contrast, you'll see he mentioned that. William James talked about the pairs of opposites. If you look carefully, it's called by Jung, the conscious and the unconscious being balanced. Uh, Leibniz said the same thing. You'll see throughout the ages that this knowledge has been there, but so few people tend to follow it. Most of the time we're trapped trying to avoid pain, seeking pleasure, living in a passionate uh, situation that is, is basically a futility instead of having a utility. So I just wanted to share with you about this, this important principle of the simultaneous of contrast, the hidden order. I call it the great discovery. Please take advantage of the great uh, discovery and the breakthrough experience. Come and join me for that. Let me teach you that. It's mind-blowing. It's absolutely inspiring. It'll bring tears to your eyes when you realize that no matter what you've done or not done, you're actually participating in a balancing act. Many times the moral hypocrisies that we've injected into our lives because of our outside authorities we've given power to has confused us and in a sense created a false ideal of a one-sided world instead of embracing the pairs of opposites in life. I want to make sure that you liberate yourself from that so you can love all parts of yourself and start to love the people in the world around you because the magnificence of the world and you as it is is far greater than the fantasies we keep imposing on ourselves. So to help you on that, I just want a, a special gift to, um, it's called Discovering the Hidden Order that Unites and Empowers Us All. It's a free on-demand masterclass. Please take advantage of this also. Come to the Breakthrough Experience, but also join and, and take advantage of this. This is a free one. Grab this masterclass. It'll, it'll be a mind bender and it'll make you think. And if you need to listen to this more than once, that's fine. I know I speak a bit fast, but this is so important to me. I, I, uh, I've been working on this for 49 years, studying the neurology and the physiology and the physics of this and the psychology and the philosophy of this. It's profound. One of the greatest, it's the greatest discovery I've made in all of my creativity and worked in 49 years is how this works. And this is a, a powerful way. If you want to love yourself and be yourself and, and really end up being more masterful in your life, please take advantage of learning these pairs of opposite simultaneities. They are absolutely mind-blowing when you see it. You're, it'll bring you tears of gratitude to see the order. So take advantage of the class. I look forward to seeing you at the Breakthrough Experience. Please go and watch this if you need to more than once to do it. Take some notes. If you need a little dictionary, that's fine. But uh, pardon me for speaking fast, but I just, I get inspired about sharing this information with people. It's very profound. And I look forward to seeing you next week for our next little webinar. Uh, please take advantage of this opportunity and I'll see you next week. Enjoy. Um, this week and um, just contemplate these pairs of opposites.